Hello, welcome to episode 14 of Sales Enabled, where I'm speaking with a former student of mine, Mark Wright. Mark is now well known as the winner of TV's The Apprentice in 2014, after which he set up marketing agency Climb Online, which he recently sold for in a region of £10 million. Mark now spends his time investing in and advising other businesses and entrepreneurs on what it takes to successfully grow and exit their companies. In today's episode, we spend a lot of time looking at the mindset of sales success, with Mark sharing some views on what a current working strategies might be setting some new salespeople up for failure rather than success. We talk about what it means to be a professional salesperson, why work-life balance should not be what people aim for at the beginning of their careers, and why intentionally networking and building key relationships are the keys to rapidly advancing your career. This is a great conversation with a very motivational and passionate salesperson, so let's jump into the show. Hey Mark, great to see you buddy. Uh, how's life? How's, you're a dad now, how's, how's that been treating you? Dan, great to see you. This is a, a blast from the past. I love doing stuff with you. I am a dad. Um, officially on January 15th, my little son William was born. So I'm uh, learning. And for, for once, I'm not the boss. I'm, I, I'm the one serving my little baby constantly. But honestly, it's given me new motivation, a new sort of purpose in my life. Um, so I'm here in a good mood. Dude, you with new purpose. You were already focused beforehand. I can't imagine. You must be like a little freaking laser beam at the moment. Just, uh, just, just. What, what's been the biggest learning? What's been the biggest learning for you so far as a dad? Um, I thought I knew love before, um, but I've never. I mean, I put it this way: if, if, if I had to give my life for my child, I'd just do it right now. Like it is that you can't imagine how much you can love another person and how much you would be willing to sacrifice yourself and of yourself to give to this other person and that was a shock i mean particularly as a as an indulgent salesman um you know who i was the center of my own universe for so many years and i couldn't be further right now from the center of my own universe and that feels so strange um but so great at the same time this is awesome like this is this is leading into what we're going to talk about today, which is how do you how do you go from now for listeners, I trained Mark, so I'm going to take full credit for all of the things he's done well. I, I'm not going to take any credit for the failures and the bumpy bits. <laughs> you keep they're all yours. Um, but let's let's go way back. Let's go back to Birmingham. Yes, right, and back to back to boot camp when we worked together when yes. you were just starting in your sales career. Now you're a dad. And, you know, now you're in this position of you've done extremely well, you've exited, you, you've kind of got this kind of idea of work-life balance, right? Yeah. That, for you, was a journey. And I know there were lots of stages. And now what we're hearing, and this is, I know, something you're passionate about, is people want to jump to the end. They don't <laughs> want to go on the journey. Right? And, and we just want this kind of work-life balance, work from home, work remotely. So let's... This is what I know you're passionate about. This is what I know the listeners are going to, they're going to be like, damn, wait, we're going there. But this is about, this is going to be controversial, right? We're going to try and ruffle some feathers. There's no such thing as work-life balance. That doesn't exist. That is what we call a fairy tale. And I have been successful at many areas of my life through focus, Mm. through dedication, through giving it time. Wherever you give your time and energy, success flows. You've just come off being super successful at a bodybuilding competition. I bet you you had no balance. You were watching what you eat. You were working out like crazy. You were focused on that date of getting to that line. So that is where your focus was. I, When I started in my sales career, my business career, that's all I did. When I when I first started, and I'm, I was very poorly educated. I was very bad at school. But one thing I've always been good at is learning from others, or as some people call it, stealing. (laughs) So (laughs) what I used to do really well in my career was find whoever was doing the best at what I wanted to do and learning from them and just replicating it like a little parrot. And there was a guy who I worked with at our former uh, business who just happened to be Australian, and he was the second best rep in the company. And I couldn't get him out for a beer quick enough because I was like, what are you doing? Just tell me who you call, how you call, what do you say, because you are the best or second best in our organization. If I do the same, I have to get the same results. And he said something really powerful to me at the time. He said, if you want to be a millionaire, go home and tell your girlfriend, your family, see you in a year and a half. And if you just focus on this for a year and a half, you'll make a fortune. 
And it light bulb went off in my head and he put it in such simple terms that whatever you want to be successful at, first you've got to have a goal, then you need to focus on that goal, then just work like crazy. And if you really want it and you just work long enough, you'll get it. And that applies to just any version of a goal in your life, your health, your family, your business, whatever it is. But most people are first don't understand what they want. They don't have goals. Secondly, they want it immediately. They don't mm. want to wait a year and a half. And by the way, a year and a half is no time at all. Uh, a month is too soon because you that means you just don't really want it bad enough. So anyone who wants anything, sales, success, life, family, fitness, first write down your goals. Put those goals where you can see them. Then just be dedicated enough to work hard enough for long enough. And I assure you, you'll get there. Brian Tracy says, how do you get to the front of the buffet line of life? Well, you get in the back and you stay there long enough to get to the front. And we're in a generation where people just want immediate satisfaction and nothing in life comes easy. And you taught me that very early on in our in our boot camp days. And you are responsible for my success in the digital marketing agency because you trained me very, very early on. And I must thank you because I sit here today being one of the most famous digital marketers in the country um, from the TV and all of that stuff. But it all started with learning and uh, and that passion that you instilled in me in Birmingham in 2012. Dude, don't don't put numbers on it. Don't. <laughs> I'm still I'm still saying I'm 27. Like <laughs> <and> a bit. <laughs> I'm still. I'm, I'm 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 yeah. Moisturizer every day. Um. Listen, thank you for the credit, and I will I will humbly accept some of it, but the work rate, the the effort you've put in, it has been all yours. And and this is it, right? And I haven't done the podcast yet about my bodybuilding. In fact, I haven't even put it on oh, LinkedIn. Oh, some <laughs> No, no, no. Spoiler alert. But there's. There's some people that know about it. I've spoken about it a lot. And actually, as, as well as the sales side, this is, this is a huge piece that people get really interested in. It's like, geez. And you're right. I just did seven months of diet, seven months, like just to get to a show. And yeah, a month wasn't long enough. Yeah. And, and it's, it's that kind of thing. And yeah, actually, you know, full disclosure, if I didn't focus everything into it, I could have easily got distracted. I could have, you know, you talk about food. My daughter leaves little bits of food on the table all the time. I'm like, daddy food, I'm going to eat that. I, don't, I couldn't do any of that. You know, we just had Easter. Okay, I had a little bit of chocolate. You know, but none of those things become as important as as the goal. And I used to, you know, I used to believe in this concept of wheel of life. And, the, you know, you should be able to make the wheel of life round. The only way you can have it round is if it's tiny. Like, yeah, that, that doesn't exist. Yeah. If you want to play small, then go ahead. You can have work-life balance. But if you want success... You have to steal, you have to borrow stuff from somewhere else in your life, and there's got to be that kind of sacrifice. So I'm glad, I'm glad you learned that. What, when you talk to people and when you say, look, you've got to put in a year and a half, what's, what's the reactions? Like, what's the reactions that you get from people when you kind of give them that? that uh, they're grossly disappointed. They are grossly disappointed. And, um, that saying, you know, about working hard to, to today, work harder today so you can live a life, you know, that beyond your wildest expectations tomorrow. It's so true. I remember when I started in uh, digital marketing because I was never the smartest person in the room, the smartest person in the team. Actually, I was much always at the lower end of the spectrum. I had to outwork everyone else. My what, Where I've always beaten everybody is just work rate. And if you speak to Tom Brady, Michael Jordan, uh, Tiger Woods, these great people in whatever sport they are, they were always at the lower ebb to start with. And it was their work rate. They've, you know, if you watch any documentary about a great sports person or a great person in the military, one of the things you'll often hear is they were the first one at practice and the last one there. I don't know how many times I've heard that or the harder I work, the luckier I get. But when I speak to people or what people ask me what I learned from working with Alan Sugar for eight and a half years, they think I'm going to give you some sort of millionaire or billionaire dust sprinkled over your head and you just get it. But the unfortunate truth is we all know what we need to do at whatever it is we need to do. Yeah. You just don't want to work hard enough to get there because mm -hmm. if you want to be the best, you're going to have to do some 10, 11 o'clock nights. You're going to have to do some 0500 starts. You're going to have to do some six and seven days. And that doesn't sound fun, but actually a year and a half is going to pass anyway. So if you want a body, you want a few more pounds in your wallet, just commit for one year, I'm going to change my life and my family's. And you'll thank yourself 
in a year and a half because I remember when I ran the London Marathon, it wasn't when I ran the marathon I got the gains or the satisfaction. It was the training I did. It was the actual, the person I became getting to the marathon. And you look at any footballer or someone who wins the lottery, 50% of them go broke within three years, 50% within three years. And it's because financial knowledge is gained on the way to making the fortune. You learn how to create money, hold money, multiply money. So when you've got the money, you get it. If it's just given to you or too much is given to you for not the right services render, you can't hold it, so you lose it. Anything is the same, fitness, your car, whatever. You must understand the process within the journey because that's where the growth is in anything. Um, and I sort of learned that the really hard way, and I say I got rich slow. And that is the best way to get there because actually people say, well, you're a millionaire, you're 33 years old. Yeah, that took 11 years. <laughs> uh, I remember the first talk I did, the first speech I gave on digital marketing, four people came and I think three of them didn't want to be there. <laughs> and now I did a talk last week, 4,000 people were at the Excel. Now people say, well, you draw a crowd. Yeah, but you didn't see the first one where I was reading off my note. My name is Mark from Australia, PPC, SEO. It was awful. But after 11 years, I look like I can deliver a speech now. So it's giving yourself that time because you know it's going to pass anyway. So just make it work. And, and you've got to understand we need to change our philosophy. Don't want more for less. Want more for life for sure, but be prepared mm. to give more of yourself. You cannot get anywhere from working less. Four day work weeks is going to ruin so many people. Work from home is ruining so many people because my career was gained. And I'm going to tell you my secrets, getting around great people, getting them to know, mm. like, and trust me. So opportunities fell my way. I was the master of smooching the boss. Did finding you, out you, where you, no, you know it. this <laughs> you know this i found out where the place we worked right where me and you, <laughs> i found out where the director went to the gym i joined the same gym oh he's from new zealand i'm from australia hey let's work out together you like working out i like oh let's go for a run all of a sudden a promotion happens there's three people i'm the guy that goes to the gym with him it's interesting couldn't do that working from home yeah what do you think well i, I went for a run with that guy and <laughs> I, I barely survived. <laughs> so it, it, do, doing anything along those lines is, is super impressive. That guy, that guy was a monster. Um, but no, this is the thing, right? It's, it's about creating opportunity. And you've said, you've said a few things there. So let's take the marathon example, right? Yep. I'm as competitive as it gets. Love being competitive. You know, I used to play PlayStation with my nephews and they were like six years old and I'd beat them and just throw the controller down and celebrate. That's, that's the kind of level. But, you know, if you want to be competitive in a marathon, you don't just turn up on the day all full of like hype and like, yeah, let's go. I'm going to crush you guys because within 100 meters, you're dead. You've got to put that work in. And this is, I think, I can't remember the quote, but it's not the will to win that counts. It's the will to prepare to win oh, and putting in all of those foundations and things. And it's the, you know, the time behind the lights or, you know, while, while people aren't watching, that actually builds you. So I like the idea of, of that journey. But yeah, you've got to create opportunity. Opportunity can come along and, you know, believe in the secret and all that law of attraction stuff, but also believe that you can create these opportunities and, and make magic happen intentionally. And like you said there, but you've got to be around people. You've got to be uh, intentional with those opportunities you create because it's those little side conversations that unlock a little bit of magic, right? It's that time where you just say, hey, you know, we haven't caught up for a bit. What's been going on? And that only happens if you're intentional with your relationship. So, you know, I think you, you, you did well, and, but incrementally stepping and knowing the direction you want to go in, that's it, build those relationships. Well, most of my biggest deals, uh, connections, wins, my first ever deal in digital marketing came from uh, hearing a guy over say in the pub, there was a customer that no one could sign up. Now, I said, sorry, you just were talking about like five reps have tried to sign up this customer and no one can get her and like whatever. So I got that lead and information from overhearing a conversation in the pub after work. Let's say I'm working from home. I don't go to the pub. I don't overhear that conversation. I never get my first deal. 
I made so many relationships opportunities by getting around the right people, being in the right environments, overhearing things, putting myself in the right place at the right time. Some call it luck. Others call it just willing yourself, you know, through the right intentions, being in the right place. But I really worry, particularly for young people who feel this work from home thing creates balance. They don't realize how much of their career progression they're putting into the bin really, really quickly. If you're coming towards the end of your career, you're in the C-suite, you're kind of winding down. I think work from home is perfect for you. Take the dog for a walk for lunch. You're not looking to take your career to the next level. And that is fine. If you understand my family is the most important thing, I want to be in the gym at 534. And I want to take the dog for a walk at lunch, I want to have the washing machine on and Sky Sports. It's for you. If you want to be successful in your career, you want to make money, and you're just starting out, you've come out of university, you've just finished an internship. If you're work from working from home, you're an idiot, you're a moron. You are not going to make it to the top of your industry ever. And you're going to ask yourself why and uh, look down and look at your sweatpants and realize that's why. (laughs) (laughs) Just checking. (laughs) No sweatpants today. I did change that then, but I have had the gym kit on this morning already. Um, But this, 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 this is huge, right? And, but the difference is this, the difference is the goal right? The difference is the goal. And you said, I want to be a millionaire. I want to be the best at this. I want to go off and do this. Yep. So many people join a company and they're like, I want a salary. I want this amount of money per month and I want to live and, you know, these kind of things. Is is it the ambition? Like, Are we, are we just generally settling for less as a people? Uh, yes. What well, The answer to that question is yes, but also people aren't that bothered anymore. My first question was not I had my first two jobs when I took it and I started uh, about the third or fourth day. And I said, hey, how much do we get paid here? I didn't even ask that question at any point until I was inside the organization. My yeah. only question I asked is, who is your best guy and what is his numbers? How do I be number one? That, yeah. How do I be the best here? That was always because I listen, I treat being a salesperson like I treat being a doctor. When I go to the pub or I tell people what I do and I say I'm a salesperson, I say it with the same conviction someone says they're a consultant doctor. I'm Mm -hmm. so proud. I've invested so much time and education in becoming a great salesperson that I I am a doctor. I'm a doctor of sales and I'm the best consultant there is. So if you want to sell something, you're speaking to an expert, right? And I treat it that way and people feel my passion when I talk about it like that. When I started my company and I'd interview employees, I was interviewing them. In the last year before I exited my company, a shift had happened and it felt like I was being interviewed by the employee. They were saying, well, on what days can I bring my dog into the office and uh, what juices do you have yeah, for breakfast? What, what do you mean? What? And how many carbon emissions does the printer produce? Do you want a job or not? You know, <laughs> at what point are you going to come here? I want to feel hunger. I want to feel passion. I want to feel I'm speaking to someone who is passionate about what they're doing. Now we're in an environment where it's what will the company do for me and how much money can I get for the least amount of work? And Mm. and you watch this economy and this country roll backwards at a rate of knots because with the introduction of artificial intelligence taking people's jobs and countries and environments who are willing to do the work, Yep. You watch the level of outsourcing and adoption to AI take people's jobs. And I say you've got to be careful for what you wish for yeah. because you will end up, don't worry about four-day work week, you'll be doing a two-day or a no-day work week before you even realise the rug's gone from beneath you. It's mad, isn't it? AI is, AI is going to be a game changer. And I, I, I played it down at the beginning. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's going to be the same game changer as Google Maps. But no, I listened to a podcast and one of my favourite authors, Seth Godin, the other day, and he's talking about the AI can do average work for everything. Like you want an average something, AI is going to do it. You want average code, you want average copy, you want average sales training. I don't want to point myself, but you know, all of these kind of things, you want average, AI is going to do that for you. So yeah. if you're at average or below, you are out of luck, buddy. You've got to become better than average and you know, significantly so to even stand a chance. Otherwise, you know, we're all in trouble. So 
I love the documentary Terminator. I was watching Terminator 3 the other day. It's happening, the rise of the machines, but we've got to stay ahead of it. So what's here's the and I know you're kind of moving into teaching and speaking and all these things. What do we need to teach people? Is it is it just appetite and hunger? Is it entrepreneurialism and, and creating opportunity or finding opportunity and, and maximizing it? Where's the solution in here? I think a lot of people suffer from uh, setting the bar far too low for themselves. They've learned to expect too little from life. And I don't know whether that's surroundings, education, environment, probably a combination of all of it. But you can have whatever you want in this life if you just know what you want out of your life and your business. And, you, you know, uh, most uh, self-made millionaires become so through working for someone else. You don't have to start or run your own business. You can work for someone else. But I think what most companies, bosses, CEOs are looking for are people with ambition. And as you say, AI can do an average job. That means you now must be better than average even to have a job soon. Right. Yep. So if you're just content with doing the bare minimum for the most amount of work, you're really going to struggle. So I think number one, I try to work with people in what do you want? Are you happy with an average body? Are you happy with an average salary? Are you happy with average children? Because if you're going to have average goals, you're going to produce average results. If you're going to have goals up here and you hit here, you know, they say you shoot for the moon, you might hit a star or whatever that saying is. I love that because. I look back at my goals from eight, nine years ago, and I'm shocked at how small they are. You know, I, 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 I can't believe the person I've become and the things that I've achieved were unimaginable to me 10 years ago. I look at my goals and I laugh a bit at how naive I was. They were so small. And if you just understand, if you set that bar higher for yourself and you achieve just less than it, you're still living an amazing life. So. By having goals and writing those down, it gives you purpose, mm. it gives you motivation. It gives you a North Star. If you get on a ship and the captain doesn't have a voyage mapped out, you don't know where that ship's going. Why would you get on there? You're just going to float yeah. around in the sea, right? Your life and business is career is no different. You need to understand what you're trying to achieve. Are you happy with how much you earn, how much you weigh, whatever it might be? Write that down. That will give you direction. Change the people that are around you in your life. Are they people that reflect who you want to be? Are they achieving things in their life that you aspire to, that they motivate you? You leave lunch with them. You feel better about yourself and your purpose. If not, change that person. Yeah. Just by changing a couple of things in your life quickly, you'll change the outcomes. But most people are not even looking at that stuff. They, if you walk down the street on the high street and say to someone, why are you going to work today? Nine out of 10 people will not be able to tell you why. And how motivating can that feel? How can that person then go and lead people or be a good manager? They can't. That's not very inspiring if your manager doesn't know what they want out of life. Yeah. You want people around you that are hungry, that are trying to achieve more. You become a better person. You become a better father or mother. You become a better manager as well. And um, I think... Just all I'm trying to get out of people at, by, uh, by annoyance through hell or high water is expect more for yourself, want more yeah. for yourself, want more for your family, and you'll be shocked where you end up. Yeah, this this you know we're, there's a couple of things in there. The number one is is the level of goals and and aiming high. I actually remember when we were at the same event, I think Sales and Innovation Expo earlier in the year, and I actually put on my intro slide a picture of me bodybuilding. And I was just at the start of my journey. I'm like, this is me as well. I'm also a bodybuilder. Just because I knew I needed to own it. And it felt so uncomfortable and so dumb. And if I look back now from like show picks to where I was in training, it's a million miles. Like that is such a, I'm not going to say it's an embarrassing picture. It's not the most flattering picture, but it was real. Right? And But I was on a journey and I knew that and I knew where I was heading. I need to aim even higher now, like genuinely, I, I do need to aim higher. But I also need to think one year, two year, three year, like that's, that's exactly. the kind of where can I get in a few years as opposed to now. So I think that's important. The other thing that you did mention there is the importance of culture is who yeah. do you surround yourself with? And, and this can be and you know, if, if I am coming to you for a job, this is what I'm asking, I'm, I'm asking, what's the culture like? How, you know, are we supportive? Are we encouraging? Are we challenging each other? Who's the best guy? Who's the second best guy? How do they play that off? How do I get in that mix? You know, we want entrepreneurial people to come in and contribute to that culture. But you as a leader, you select the people on the team 
and they're going to reinforce that culture as well. So I think you hired extremely well. You brought some really good people in to to say, look, this is a standard. We don't expect anything less than this, and you know, you come to play. But that's that's you know, it's that interesting balance, isn't it? And years ago, actually, before we met, I was a an educator, a teacher in formal education. I left because everybody got a, a certificate. I couldn't yeah. stand that culture of, hey, what well I'm for turning up. Here's your passing thing. It just didn't work for me in the real world. And that doesn't feel good. You know, when you get a certificate you haven't earned, you don't feel good about yourself. There's nothing like getting a certificate when you've earned it. Yeah. Uh, and you know you're the best barometer of yourself. You'll know when you've earned something and when you're kind of getting a bit of a, a free ride and that creates that mediocrity because a business or a sports team or whatever can only go as good as their, their worst player. And I used to say in our Monday morning meetings, you're on the pitch now for Real Madrid. We are the best there is. And I've got a line waiting to join Real Madrid, right? Yeah. You're on the pitch now. You're playing for the best because you are the best. I used to tell my people that they would think they're 50 foot tall and mm. bulletproof. I used to give them so much reinforcement about what was possible for them, how much they could earn, what they could achieve in their careers because I needed to see it before they could in a lot of re respects so they could see it. And I dragged a lot of people. I made a lot of millionaires. I created a lot of people to go on and live very great lives who didn't see much for themselves when they, they first met me. And actually, that's where I've got a lot of satisfaction and why I do so much speaking now, because it was people who, when I met them, they were working in Waitrose. One of my guys, he was, he was in the car park at Waitrose. He worked for me. He left on the board, you know, and, and all of these sort of stories where I'd meet someone in fitness first or in the supermarket and now they're multimillionaire. That is a great example of I can take any person and with the right ingredients and really push them to the next level and they achieve super success. And it's a shame now how a bit of tough love, they sometimes call it bullying, right? There is bad things that happen in the workplace. There is bullying. There are yeah. bad things that happen. But there's also some of the greatest managers I've ever had have been the toughest on me. They've said, Mark, you can do more. I've seen you do better work than that. And at the time, I didn't like that manager. But now I look back and I'm so thankful I had that person in that my life because they pushed me to be better. And the, the culture is a fine line of knowing when someone needs pushing and when someone needs an arm around them. And great mm. management is understanding every person is different. Every person's motivation is different. So who am I talking to? What is their mental capacity? What is their motivation point? And activating that. And it's if you try to manage a team with the same ethos, it doesn't work. You need to manage people individually. And the more you understand your product and your people, the better everything goes. I think I think we learned that lesson when we first started work together. I think we we had a great culture. I think we brought some great people in. And I'm not gonna mention his name, but Engin did some good hiring. <laughs> <laughs> he hired good. me. Well, there you go. You know, I think that uh, uh, I think at the moment that time was just going to Heathrow Airport with the sign saying, do you want a job? It's basically <laughs> anybody who just landed, which was fortunate because we've got some great people that way. Um, but you, you talked about sales leaders within that. I remember our CEO at the time, he had a similar hiring plan. He'd just go into all sorts of places and his, he'd, he'd hire people from the restaurant. He'd hire people from the gym and all those kind of things. And he had an amazing way of just finding people with a spark or something. He he was brilliant with people. I just remember some of the lessons that he taught, not not by speaking, but by doing. And I was like, geez, that that's that's insightful and, and picking the right people. Because like you say, if you've got I think you know, it's it's you've got to earn your space in the boat. If we go with the kind of rowing metaphor, if there's like a, a limited space in the boat, we can only hold a certain amount of people. And I've got other people that want to get on the boat. Like, what are you doing? I'm not having yeah. somebody coast. It's like you're here to come and play, but the vehicle is going to make you successful. And that's it. So let's talk about that because you talked to a little bit earlier about staying in line, getting in line. Why sales for you? Why was it that you talked about, you know, being able to kind of build relationships, but why, why did you think, right, I'm going to be a salesperson? That's, that's the kind of direction I want to go. Uh, firstly, it was through more necessity. Uh, than it was anything else because I wasn't qualified to get any other job. I didn't have the school grades to get into um, a formal education through university. Um, so sales was really the, 
only job that was open to me. And so I started as a waiter waiting tables and all these different jobs, and I was really bad at them. And then one day um, I was at the gym and uh, a guy offered me a job selling gym memberships. Mm -hmm. And um, the, in the, the country, it, I was living in Australia at the time, and in the country there was, uh, I think it was about 65 or 70 branches of this gym. And they had 140 membership consultants. And it was the first time, because I'd always thought growing up I was going to be a football player, soccer player in Australia. And I never really bothered too much about anything else because I was always into my fitness. All I cared about was playing football. Sales was the first job that ever ranked me in a table, in mm. like a football table, like my football team was. And when I started as a membership consultant out of 140, I was zero. I was the 140th. I was at the bottom. And each time I sold a deal, I could see my name moving up the table, just like football. So there were so many competitive elements like sport that it – Felt like I was playing football every day. So it was the first time where a job, I actually enjoyed it because it was competitive. There was, didn't matter when I waited tables, if I did a good job or bad job, I got $7 an hour. Sales was the first time where I could see myself going up and I was winning awards and my pay went up in line in going up. Mm. So I think it activated the right juices in me, so to speak. That it, it spoke to my personality and, and my background and uh, I enjoyed speaking to people. I enjoyed meeting different people. And I enjoyed the art of selling. By changing a word, you could change a response. By shaking a hand or sitting in a certain way or crossing your legs or putting your hand here or a pen there, you can change the flow of a conversation. And I found it like chess. And I got so into, you know, NLP and uh, all of these different forms of selling and, and asking questions and when to listen, when to speak and all of these things that it just became an art form for me. And I loved every minute of it. And then when I found digital marketing, and the reason I love digital marketing is because to be quite frank with you, any old mug can sell gym memberships. But then you get into service based selling, which is educationally an educational sell a harder sell, like what we call a consultative sell, where your product can be so wide to any business that it has to be tailored, uh, the cost and, and set up. It gets tough. So you take the top layer, the best salespeople only survive in consultative selling. And digital marketing, I believe, was almost the Olympics of selling. So to survive in digital marketing, you had to be really good. You had to be yeah. really hot. Um, so... Uh, I work with some of the great salespeople, I think, in our organization who have gone on to grow and, and organize great companies um, because they were great salespeople. And I believe the best communicators and the best salespeople become the best business owners. Yeah. No, it's, the, the communication piece is, is huge. And actually, you know, that competitive nature, that's probably what caused you to say, well, you couldn't, five of your reps couldn't sell it. I'm going to go and sell that. Is you want that competitive nature. So, yeah, I, I, I can see that. And so, okay, so let's, we've got a little bit of time left. I wanna, I'm gonna steal some of your sales success secrets, right? And not secrets, you know, we, we've heard it's all work, 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 but there must have been some things you've learned. So, you know, this is, this is about sales. This is about how do we become better salespeople? What were some of the key lessons you learned about how to be effective at selling? So you talked about some of the techniques, like NLP listing, stuff like that. Um, what were some of the biggest lessons as a salesperson that you learned about selling persuasion, getting people to take action as well? Because the, the, the big one at the moment is, oh, think about it, status quo bias is just killing everyone. How did you get people to feel comfortable taking action? And the reason this is important is because, as you mentioned, if you can sell in digital sales, you can sell anything. A billion people were selling to people every single day. We were the 130th call trying to sell Google at nine o'clock in the morning. Like it was, it was a shark tank and yet you kind of, you made it out successfully. So what did you learn about sales in that journey? Uh, the first thing and the most important thing is you have to understand what you're selling. You have to be an expert at whatever you're selling. And I saw a direct correlation. The more I understood the product, the more I could communicate in depth about its features, the better my sales did. There's no shying away from that. You can only blag it so far in sales, honestly. And a bit of blagging never hurts in sales. Let me be completely honest. But the more you understand what it is you're selling and the features of that product, 
the more the customer can sense because customers aren't idiots. And when yeah. they're sitting across from an expert, they'll feel that. They'll hear your knowledge come through in your answers or uh, rebuttals to, to, to any of their questions or whatever it might be. The more you understand your product, the more your sales will go up. So before you go into anything, make sure you're passionate about that subject and you understand what on earth it is you're selling because that will help you more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, two, being able to communicate effectively is so important. Like that I have worked so much on my speaking, the way I speak, if I say, um, when I, when I know when it's to listen or when it's time to speak, because people really have to like you and understand you to buy from you. And I'll give you an example of this. One of my um, top sales reps, it was right at the bottom of the ladder of my organization, and he was a great guy. He understood the product, really charming chap, but his accent was too heavy. His mm. accent was so thick, so heavy. So I paid for him to go on an elocution course. Oh, no way. His sales tripled almost immediately. Same guy, same knowledge, changed the way he spoke. Sales increased. That's amazing. So, we now understand our product. We can communicate it effectively. And one thing, the biggest thing is how to go for the jugular, I call it. How do you go for the kill? How do you get that sale? Well, the best thing you can do is put time sensitivity on anything. So, for example, if you don't do this, your competitors will. And that drops you out of this, uh, out of the race. You don't, you, because I always created a scarcity in the way I sold is listen, I'm the best at what I do and I'm a bit arrogant and the way I sell it's not for everyone. I used humor because yep. you use your own personality. If you're a serious person, my style of selling wouldn't work for you because I'm, yes, okay, I know when it's time to be serious, but I'm a bit of a cheeky chappy. I use jokes. I use humor to build rapport. I understand my product. And then I say, listen, you know I'm the best at what I do. And I want to give this what I do to your organization and help you. But let me tell you, I need to make money and pay my mortgage. And if you don't buy it from me, I'm going to sell it to Fred down the road, who you bloody hate. And he's your best competitor for 20 years. And if you buy it from me, I'm not going to give it to Fred. Now, that's a cheeky way of doing it at work for me. Or I would create a price special. I will drop the setup fees or I will do this. But I can only do it till Friday. Price is a hot point. Competition, yeah. sell it to them hot point. Being so good and saying, what are your goals? Well, you want to turn over X, have this many staff, this amount of products? Buy it from me today, we'll be there in six months. Buy it from me in one month, we'll be there further down the line. So if you're serious about achieving your goals in your business, you need to buy it from me today, or I know you're not serious about achieving your goals. So don't tell me you are. So challenging the customer on their goals and what they're trying to achieve. So I... I've got a lot of tricks in my hat and up my sleeve, and I will change my tactic to put pressure in the end of the sale based on the customer that I'm dealing with. Because I understand if, if you tell me during my needs finding that you hate the guy down the road, I'm going to use him to close the sale. If you tell me your goals, I'm going to use those to close the sale. If you tell me the price is a hot point for you, I'm going to use price. So I'll just tailor up my approach to the person that I'm working with in front of me because sometimes, you know, if I use your competitor down the road but you already think you're 10 times bigger, it ain't going to work. So it's, it's, it's really changing that approach. But, again, I learned a lot of that fr from yourself in, in, in training. I'm still teaching the same things, buddy. And what, you, what you're coming up with is, you know, largely from a guy called Robert Cialdini who wrote a book called Influence, Psychology of Persuasion, which is still – the number one book that I recommend to all salespeople that read, and still I'm surprised at how few of them have read it. It's insane. Oh. And he's come up with others since then, but scarcity is the biggest one. Like we, we get it all the time. We book hotels or flights. It's like there are three other people looking at this one. I'm like, get it now, get it now. Like, come on. Booking.com does that to me every time, and I hate it, and I still book, and I know what they're doing. <laughs> we, this is the thing. We know it, and we're, we're immune. But the other one, like, I love what you're talking about there, commitment and consistency, holding people accountable to the words they've said before. These are your goals. Well, you know, are you going to do the things that goals achieving people are going to go and do, or are you just going to sit here and think about it? Like that calling people on that stuff, and I think we have a similar way of doing it. If you can do it and be a little bit cheeky or you can do it with a smile afterwards, then, then you get away with it, right? Or, or, you know, if you're so serious that you just like, okay, I'll do it. But you've got to play to your personality. Exactly. And the only way you can do that is through 
repetition, right? And that comes back again to work rate is you're not going to just walk straight into the million dollar deal and say, hey, you know, I'm going to go to Fred down the road. Just like, get out of here, mate. Like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> so, it, 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 you, I love when people used to say to me, I need to check with my wife. I mean, I've heard every objection there is in sales. And now it's like, um, for me, like I said, it's like chess. If you move that piece, I know which three I'm going to move now. So if yeah. you say I'm going to ask my wife, oh, my God, yeah, I'm, I'm already salivating at the mouth because I know I've got you. It's all over. I'm going to have their credit card out of their pocket in about four minutes. So, it, 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 but I've read every book on sales. I've listened yeah. to every podcast on sales. I got obsessed with it. Um, and, and I think one thing that we both have done really well in our sales careers and why we're head and shoulders above the rest is educating yourself is important. So yeah. important. You know, sometimes I've read a sales book and it's garbage. I now know what not to do. I've read, um, books on closing i've read books on objections so now no matter what comes up for me in a meeting i'm educated i'm ready and i'm ready to try stuff i'm ready and as that repetition just like going for a run or doing weights oh i need to ask my wife i now know all of the lines i'm going to say he's going to think i'm making it up on the spot i've said it 450 times before what what were some of your and and if you say me i'll i'll, I'll cry out of <laughs> just but so don't I don't want to crank up. Um, what were some of the biggest uh, inspirations for you? Like you, you, you've learned some things over the way. You talked about books. You talked about all of those things. Were there people? Were there moments? Were there deals? What were some of the biggest learning things for you? There was a. I, I've been very lucky in my in my career and my journey to have so many motivational moments. The first one I ever. Um, I think one of the goals we were set when, when we were working in the company that you talk about was to download like an audio book. And I'd never listened to an audio book before. And I, I downloaded Brian Tracy's 21 Secrets to Make Becoming a Self-Made Millionaire. Nice. And it was like the first self-help thing I ever did for myself. And it, I listened to it on the tube when I ever was going into work. It really was the first time I heard a lot of the stuff I still say today. So that was it. I had a lot of great managers in my time who spent time teaching me how to make cold calls, how to write a proposal, how to follow up in the correct way, how to roll. I hated role playing because it felt yeah. fake. I always hate things that feel fake. I always preferred, you know, being in the real deal. There's no good. It's like sparring and being in the boxing match. For me, being across toe to toe, sniffing the customer and really being at the belly of the beast struggling to get the sale was always how I learned best because you could practice all the lines in the world. But when the customer says it in real life and you're in the clothes, that was when I was, my tail was wagging, right? Yeah. Um, so experience was a good motivator. But um, for me, initially, it was always about being number one. And it was little things. Winning awards meant more to me than the paycheck. I remember the first time I made 8,000 pounds commission, which Today, it means nothing. It was a lot of money to me at the time. But I also won like, uh, you know, person of the month and bestseller in the team. That was more to me than the £8,000. So for me, it was always about showing other people I was good. Yeah. It was always about being the best uh, and doing better than I did the month before. And they were my motivators and just learning from other people. The great, you know, I looked at my 30th birthday. I had my 30th birthday in Las Vegas. And when I looked out and I was giving my speech, I was shocked at how many of my customers were in the audience. And to me, that was a proud moment because that showed me that I was really good at what I did for the fact that my customers would spend their own money to come to my 30th birthday abroad. One shows me how much the good service I'm providing, but two, all that stuff I say in the sales process is not fake. You know, I hate when companies say we're a family here, it's my it's my hatred line but actually my staff and my customers became some of my best friends and like family because yeah. i really cared for their business and for them and they could feel that and that was that was my motivation but also why i was successful yeah i i recently listened to the netflix document so i'm still doing the audiobooks i love the audiobook there's a there's one called no rules rules about netflix and they they talk about this idea of being a family as well and they say that we're not a family. We're not because, you know, you wouldn't fire your Uncle Bob and, and stuff like that from, from a family business. But we're actually like a professional sports team. So you saying that you like Real Madrid. 
And there's something about being on a winning team that brings people together, right? That's it's that camaraderie. It's that we've been through hell to get here. And, you know, we're successful and that brings people close together. And actually, you know, from my days of playing football, I'm still in, in very good touch with people that I was on the field with. And, you know, there's only 11 of you on the pitch at the time. That's that's a bond and, and that, that brings people together. So I'm not surprised that people followed you to Vegas. Plus, it's Vegas. Yeah, so, oh, exactly. so what else, what else they, do? They chose a good de- uh, uh, destination. But I think really... My point about the family thing is I hate that saying and I hate when companies saying it, um, but what I do take from it is to be successful as a business owner or a manager, you really must care about your people and your uh, customers. And when I was letting people go, I was always saw it from the view that if I was letting someone go because they weren't being successful, I was doing them a favour. By holding someone in a career they mm-hmm. can't excel at, what sort of disservice is that? to to them as long as you're doing things in an ethical appropriate manner you're helping everyone out and i think some people are just trying to sell 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 without actually knowing their product caring for their customer caring for their team and if you fix that that comes across to everyone your team and customers and you do better yeah did you've given some amazing insight on the call today i'm gonna i'm gonna get two more questions out here and then we're, we're gonna wrap it up so yeah, we've talked about work rate, we've talked about learning, we've talked about competition, trying to be the best. Um, we've talked about all those things. We've also talked about the frustration of four day work weeks, bring your dog to work day, uh, you know, what flavor water is in the canteen today or anything along those lines. Top three piece of advice for, for the person who's saying, right, sales, I want to get in sales. It's my first or second sales job. I'm going to go and get this, this sales job. I'm going to go and do it. Three just punchy piece of advice. What would you tell new sellers to go and do right away? Well, the first one is to get into sales. We're not seeing enough people come into the market as salespeople. Sales are seen as this yucky, you know, taboo uh, career. It's amazing. You know, no one can yeah. earn as much money as a good salesperson. So, tip one, consider being a salesperson. Tip two, be open to education learn as much as possible from great salespeople and listen to podcasts like this, read books, go to seminars, because it really does help. And three, set big goals. And one of those goals should always be to be number one salesperson. If I'm interviewing a salesperson, I'm, I'm looking out for one question. Who's the best person here? How do I be the best person? Because great sellers are competitive. A great salesperson should always be competitive, set high goals, understand what you're selling, educate yourself and want and be proud of becoming a salesperson and you will have a great career. Beautiful. No, I love that. And yeah, treat sales as it is a profession. It's a career. This is a lifestyle. This is what you are, who you are. Be proud, like you said earlier. That's why, okay, so the, the, yeah, last... that's why I think I was good at it. I was proud of my yeah. career as a salesman. I saw it as being a doctor. And it worked well for me mentally. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so now the seasoned salesperson who's listening to this and thinking, right, Mark, I've mastered all of this. How do I transition? Like, I'm really good at this. How do I go, like you did, I was a salesperson. How do I set my business up? How do I do that? Like, I want to make that jump to do my own thing. What does that look like? Okay, there's no right time to start a business. You know, when I speak to people, they always say, well, if I do this and I'll wait for that commission check and I'll wait for the year-end bonus and I'll wait and I'll wait and this will happen and the sun will come up and it'll be this and it's never going to happen. You've got to do it. You need to write a date down like your bodybuilding competition, put a date in the diary, that's the date I start my business. If you feel you are wanting to start a business, that's a good enough motivation. If you know and understand and like an industry, that's a good enough motivation. You just need to do it. Starting a business is far easier than you imagine. Staying in business is far harder than you imagine. So it's having the courage to go into your boss's office and resign and just do it, by the way, because they they don't really care as much as you think. You don't care as much as you think. Just go and do it. Um, And then have the courage to start. And just like the marathon, you will be shocked at the person you become in that journey of surviving the first 18 months of business, you'll be a completely different person, a much better person. Uh, so just do it is my advice, is every person I talk to, they tell me if that these eight things happen, they would start a business. Well, those eight things are never gonna happen, so forget about it. You're never gonna be a business owner. Um, yeah. So it's just 
the biggest step is the hardest step is just starting, just doing it. Man, that's such good advice. Like just, just, um, and you know, people can do side hustles now. You can start the business, you know, and if, you, like you say, if you're putting 40 hours, this is a Brian Tracy thing. If you're putting 40 hours in a week, that's to keep you level. It's everything over 40 hours. I that's what makes your lifestyle. That's, I, I, I can't do the accent. But that's going to be coming in. It's true. And a lot of people I talk to in the side hustle world, <laughs> um, and, you know, I like side hustles. I had side hustles. I, I know and like that stuff. But you will never be where you want to be while you have while your side hustle is your main interest. Yeah. You've got to have the courage and the focus to give your business everything. So it's having the courage to walk into your boss and being honest. I really feel passionate about doing something for myself. I've always wanted to do it. If it doesn't work out, I'd love to have the opportunity to come back. I'm leaving on the 14th of May, you know, and you will feel, whew, you will feel yeah. amazing when you do it. And actually, you'll never be back because you'll make it happen when you must make it happen. Amazing. Mark, I am, I am excited. I'm pumped. I, I need to go for another workout or something. Along <laughs> those lines. Um, this, this has been phenomenal and so good to catch up with you. Life has, life has rewarded you for the effort you've put in. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and I'm sure it's going to continue to, to do so. Um, given that you're talking about making connections and, and being intentional, how can people connect with you? What's the best way to, to hear more about what you do? Well, being the SEO expert that I am, if you just search for Mark Wright on any given platform, I'm verified on all and uh, will come up in the top one or two. So look for me, the Australian guy with uh, dark hair called Mark Wright on all social media. I'm, I'm having a, uh, a business conference on marketing and business. And if you're interested in bettering yourself and, and achieving more in your life and your business, I'd love to, to see you there. And it's much of this, but for two days. So uh, amazing. Love to see you there and all the information's on my social media. But Dan, thank you for doing what you do and everything that you've given me in my journey as well. We've crammed a ton into an hour today, Mark. So what you can do in two days is going to be phenomenal. I'll put some links in uh, okay. into the show notes. But yeah, buddy, it's, it's been uh, a pleasure. I can't believe it's been 11 and a bit years or whatever it's been. Uh, let's see great. what we can do over the next few years. Eh? <laughs> Thanks, mate. You know what I think, Ron? I think that was a sales call. Good job, buddy. So you're going to buy a subscription? No, I already get the times. Bye-bye.